That's the way it works, eh? Yeah, so you should be in virtual conferences, uh, how we use Drupal to save the company. And quite literally, as you'll see, uh, we'll have a conversation about that. Uh, so I just want to kind of have an open conversation about what we had to do, uh, business decisions and, and technical decisions. Uh, I want to show some like real world business use cases for Drupal and uh, what we did as custom solutions and uh, actually provide some real code examples and then you guys can kind of you know take away some some big ideas from this and I, I want to say this is uh, kind of a case study talk but very open-ended so if there's any questions you can just kind of jump in at any time I think we have a lot of content to cover uh, not really sure how fast we'll go through it but but uh, we'll see how it goes and it is there will be a lot of technical information in here so I think it'll be really useful um, so conference catalyst is a uh, we're event management and uh, association organization. And uh, so the, for purposes of this talk, we really do conference management. Um, and we're all, we were 100% on-site management. We actually use third-party uh, software to do all of our networking applications and things like that. Welcome. Our CEO here. So we're, we're platinum uh, sponsors of the camp this year. We want to give back to the community. And um, we are looking to hire, so I'll mention that at the end. Uh, so if you're interested in that and what we're doing, please come speak to me. Uh, so we have a digital solutions team. We do all kinds of, of things, but mainly in Drupal we'll do content management. Uh, we've built a product, which I'll be sharing today, um, called Conflux and we do various uh, design and other support tasks for our conference management and association management side of things. So the, uh, our main clients in our business is primarily around uh, the IEEE and their organizations. And we, we do full service on-site event management. And uh, the type of conferences that we typically run are highly technical, so you're going to submit their paper submissions and they organize these sessions and then you go hold uh, obviously the sessions and there's multiple papers being presented in each each session. Uh, these can range from uh, 60 presentations up to 1,200 presentations, so they can get rather large. Uh, you know, we saw traffic as much as 5,000 attendees at a single conference um, in the virtual sense. That includes authors and actual registrants. Um, so that's kind of the business case that we had. So we, in 2020 when the pandemic hit, it was immediately apparent that we were going to have to change from this typical model and move into a virtual space. And so we created this application Conflux and that's what I'm gonna go through today is kind of how we dreamed this up and the execution of, of everything and all and some of the challenges and, and the you know the technical execution quite literally. Uh, so it is a virtual event uh, management content delivery system and it is at its core Drupal. Um, it's built to support the conferences themselves. It doesn't run it seamlessly like a hop in or something like that. It is uh, it is a sort support mechanism alongside of uh, the content managers, or the conference manager, managers, excuse me. Um, so the kind of things we had to deal with, data consumption, like how the heck do we get all of these papers together? How do we get all their information? Actually deploying each individual application, uh, migrating all of that data. So we did a lot of migrations work. And then of course, every client wants their own sort of spin and look and feel. So we had a, a lot of design work uh, and then just overall execution and delivery. So starting kind of with uh, the data consumption part of it, as I call it, like we had, to, we had to deal with variable sources. So we didn't have one system to kind of plug into. Uh, we have the, we have these paper management systems that we had to pull in data from and collect and it looked different every single, for almost every single one of our clients. Um, and so we, we used Google Sheets, 
we had to do some custom parsing of, of a lot of the data that would come in. And we used web forms heavily, and that's quite literally the Drupal web form module, heavily uh, to intake those submissions and then of course migrations and, and different APIs. Uh, so that's kind of what I just spoke of, are the, the variable sources, there was no consistency and uh, just dealing with the data was, was very tricky because it was all kinds of third party systems. Uh, this goes from registration to the actual data uh, that they were putting together. So they would put together their sessions based on um, presentation data coming from papers and they would pre-organize a lot of things in this over in, in this space and then we had to consume it on the virtual on the virtual side. And so we actually took and we decided that Google Sheets would be probably the best interface that everyone already knew and was familiar with we create a CSV boilerplate for them to actually uh, deploy their data into. And that way we could create kind of a consistent, everybody has the same uh, set of data at the end of the day. And uh, it was really, it's really easy to consume and uh, write migrations for things like that. Uh, one really cool service that we ended up using, uh, sheetdb.io. It's great, it just connects into, it is a paid service, but it connects into to Google directly and turns your data into a JSON REST API. Um, kind of a gotcha here, there was a period of time where Google Sheets exposed JSON directly. There was kind of a tricky endpoint you could use, and then they shut that down in like halfway through um, last some point last year. And that's actually what forced us to just quickly switch to a, to a service that could provide that endpoint for us. So we quickly just rewrote all the migrations to point to that um, service and, and that's how we consume data. So we would take all of this data into our uh, Google Sheets as kind of like a flat file and then we'd actually connect into uh, the Google Sheets API, pull all that data down, parse it, find all the unique users for example, find all the presentations and uh, we would remodel it into what eventually would become like the actual data models within our Drupal application. And then that would make it easier for migrations to directly import all of this information. Uh, after we kind of do all of that front end work, we actually need to ask presenters to present their data and re pre record all of their, um, all of their sessions. And so through a lot of different management, uh, trickery, we, we would get them to try to have submissions ready, you know, within a month uh, or a month out from actually launching the application, which in a way was its own challenge. Uh, but we would generate these uh, links that basically just had all of the information in the URL. So we had a standalone, we have a standalone web form, uh, Drupal application running web form and we would send everybody to this application to actually submit their videos, which would then end up dropping into AWS, and we uh, would then export that at the end into that, those Google Sheets again, so that we could combine that with the uh, data that we had prepared earlier from that. There's a couple tricks in there, We'd, uh, a couple of hooks that we would use, uh, hooks, hook form options, um, there was an options alter that we had to use, specifically to take the data from the URL and parse it into like the actual choices that you would get because we wanted that to be dynamic based on the parsed data and be able to pass it in, uh, you know, coming directly from the presenter who is, uh, yeah, so the actual migration component of this, it's the whole purpose of it was to initiate the database. So Conflux is, is sitting there at this point just ready for data and it's, it's starting to be prepared and being set up. And uh, so we spent a long, long time on migrations, making sure they were you know, all, all correct. Like I said, we'd use sheetdb.io at the end of the day. So everything, we're just connecting to JSON data. And uh, there's a couple of really great resources out there for migrations. Uh, there's many, many different techniques that you can take. Uh, in migrations to move data around, so it's a super powerful tool. I've got just some examples 
on here, uh, you know, it's a where we're processing different types of data. For example, this this overwrite properties. In the case where we needed to do like mass updates of the data, because whatever we migrated in uh, needed to be changed rapidly, like adding new passwords for users or something like that, you can you can write migrations to look up what you already migrated, of course, and then uh, override certain properties of that data. So we use that technique quite a bit, and uh, of course grouping. And uh, this was all just it's all run from the command line. We didn't implement anything special in a UI for you to, to come drop in this information um, because it was all sitting and prepared in Google Sheets and then we just uh, would be able to run the migrations after that parsing step. And so we, we used Platform SH uh, for our deployments and uh, so this was, this was a solution that we could, you know, we felt like it was very scalable, trustworthy, and you'll see in a minute we actually uh, had to run two applications in parallel on this on the service, so uh, that allowed us to do so. So we didn't have to have two decoupled uh, applications. And so we're actually running Node and then um, Nginx and PHP and everything on uh, on two different applications within within Platform. And um, you know that containerized YAML approach that we were able to use Git deployments. Uh, we had our we have our main application, so we could deploy that at any time to override the existing application. But then, of course, with every uh, platform instance, you do have your own Git repository there, so you could just continue on in th with that and create a complete fork. That gave us the ability to have every application be 100% that clients for that like short short period of time, which is actually worth mentioning. Uh, Conflux itself is not a long-lived application. It's only intended to be available for the client for about a month. Um, that's that was our like average length of time that this would be online. So it was there was a lot of rapid deployment and then uh, just quick archiving of these applications. So your typical conference of you know three to five days, uh, but we would leave it online for access, you know, kind of in a permanent way for for a month. Uh, once the you know deployment happened one key thing that we did, we managed everything through the config system. So we would just use the config sync directory and we would install directly from that. Uh, and this was just an efficiency situation. It made things quicker for us. Uh, we could easily maintain all the configuration we wanted to start with and then be able to deploy it. We do use config split in different ways to kind of manage different uh, features on the site. but but they have no significance here, like a features set up or anything like that. Um, and the key, the keys to this is just using the drush si existing config command, and essentially you've created your own installation profile based on your config directory, so it's a pretty cool tool. And when we needed to deploy over and over, if there was a change in the core software that we needed to deploy before the launch of one of these, for example, uh, we used con config ignore patterns to help us so we could still deploy the, the main application, but pieces that we had changed per application would then not get overridden. And so that was uh, kind of a really key component. Uh, we use, there's a module site settings and configuration that just helps us set different um, pieces of the application as kind of a settings interface. And then we can use that in theming and, and, and other uh, logic. Uh, and as, a, as I had mentioned on here, all of these sites were standalone, um, but they all came from an original uh, code set. So then each one of the applications we deployed, like I had mentioned earlier, the, the client wants it to look like them, like their branding and things like that, but we were really trying to sell this as an application. So we knew we couldn't get by with, with saying no all the time, well, you can't have your logo, you can't have your colors, we can't move this and that around. So there was a, a pretty heavy design component to this. After any application was would be launched, we'd be able to kind of customize how it, the look and feel of it, and we would just use asset injector uh, modules for that. And of course, those patterns would be ignored in config, so those would never be overridden if we had to deploy that data again. Um, and then we used uh, 
this was kind of a way that we began our exploration into Tailwind. And so we built a complete custom theme based on Tailwind. And I'll actually, we'll have a talk tomorrow um, that you can check that out. Stephen and I will be giving that talk and uh, we'll kind of give you the basis of how to get a theme for Tailwind started in, in Drupal. And it's easier than you think. Um, yeah. Do you have a base one, just a Tailwind thing, just like I'm big on Tailwind, do you have yeah. a base one you start from? Or? That's, yeah, we've created a starter that we're kind of working on so that you could pull that down. Um, and it will be starting with Tailwind 3.x, so whatever version that's on. And uh, yeah, so you should check that out. Um, but with that classes and utilities everywhere kind of approach, there's some pretty cool tricks we did in Tailwind to let, uh, to let Drupal use that. But because we tried to push more of our classes uh, as far as uh, the components are concerned into views and into the configuration system so that we could easily override those. Uh, so we did have components that were heavily themed and hard-coded, but when, when you uh, set your style specifically in views, you can just come in and override and say change the margin or change the color or something like that very rapidly uh, upon a client request. So that was kind of why we took that, took that approach. <laughs> And just some quick like Drupal modules that's, that solve some things quickly for us. Uh, views full calendar so we could display you know, the whole calendar of, of the event, all the sessions on a calendar. Flagging for uh, bookmarking and like check-ins for gamification and different things like that. So flag is a great resource for that. Site settings and labels, as I mentioned, is a module for, to, you know, if you want configuration uh, to be, to kind of come with your site that you can that you can select and change. It, it uses the field system, so you can just set your whole settings, different settings panels directly in there without code, so that's a nice thing. Vot voting and things like that, of course, for rating system, rating each presentation, again, more kind of gam gamification stuff. Web form, of course, for submissions and actual communication. So we did use web form in Conflux to send emails to attendees and, and different things like that, and uh, actually generate one of the features I'll talk about here pretty soon. Um, so now to get to some kind of cool stuff we did uh, integration wise, I've talked about Google Sheets but we've got some more um, real world code examples. And of course I like to, I like to think this is Israel so yeah. he's going to jump in and, and have something to say. I feel like I'm the, this banana that kind of comes up so I just kind of say a few that, things and then he does, he does all the coding. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's how I code everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, my name is Israel Morales. I'm from Mexico. And um, I'm a full stack developer. Yeah. yeah. I mess with all back end and front end. So I kind of do everything that he wants me to do. <laughs> so, yeah, Google Sheets API. So, um, yeah, there was a need to import like users on demand. And these users were manually curated in a Google Sheet. So sometimes like some users were updated like password or maybe roles or stuff like that. So we needed to run on demand like imports from Google Sheets. Um, and also like another need was that we needed to avoid duplicates. So if let's say you have a Google Sheet with 25 users and you update one, so the import should be smart enough to update just the roles or the password. So for that, I created a custom Drupal 8 plus module. I say that is Drupal 9 because it should be compatible. So we haven't tested that. So and and an overview of how this module works is like it fetches uh, the data via JSON, and um, and the key here is that. It converts each of those rows in the Google Sheet into a into a queue into a batch API item. So it uses the database in, in Drupal to keep track of how many users are you gonna process. And like I said, if the user doesn't exist, it, it creates the user, and if it exists, like it updates the user. Um, this this uh, module needs human integration. So basically, like whenever like someone updates a Google Sheet, it's gonna click a button and it's gonna do the import. And the page API basically 
Like if you have like a hundred items to process, like creates a separated AJAX request. So it keeps track that everything is processed. So one thing with PHP is that you can run out of memory and that could be bad for you, like when you're managing like a lot of data. So even if we have like 150 users or 2,000 users, it's gonna like process each user, right? So, but you need to wait for all the process that happens. And then a screenshot of the, um, so I have a form, a configuration form. Uh, you put the URL of the, um, the spreadsheet and then you click this button and all the magic happens. And then you process all the users and you see the progress like of each like user being processed. Um, that's like a general overview. There are two ways of processing large amounts of data. So I'm going to talk about the second because this was my first like implementation. I was like, yeah, this is good enough. The bad thing is like you need a, someone like clicking that button like each five minutes or each 10 minutes when, once a conference happens or is started. So random say like 70% um, of our clients use uh, CVent, um, which is a, it's a service that provides the registration and payment for like this kind of events. And they do have an API, so we say like, we should take advantage of that API and do an integration. Um, I'm very proud of this thing that I created because the, the problem was when, when a conference started, like they needed to manage those Google Sheets like manually. And if you have like the day of the conference, like let's say today, like 20 users registered. So you needed to process those users and get it into the system and create an account and create roles and create a password. So we, we, th we thought on a solution. So we created a custom integration with the Cvent API. And for this one, I use the Q API, which is a little bit different. It also tracks like every, like every user in the database, but it's a little bit different because it can be done in the, in the back via current jobs. So you don't, you don't need to see the interface, but you know the users are being processed. Um, so I have, so I split this task into two current jobs. Um, because like, so for the, for the first current job, I'm using a classic hook cron. And this, this first cron is just like fetching like 200 users at the time with a timestamp. And he's like created that into the Q API database. So we have like 200 rows. And I, I am storing the data of that user in a JSON object in that table. So it's not, this is still a JSON, so it's not a PHP object. And in the cron number two, I'm processing each of those JSONs and converting those users into a PHP objects and mapping it to the database. So basically cron one is a lean process and cron2 is a heavy process where you need to process all those users. So sometimes like in, in a range of like five, no, let's say like one hour, you have like 50 users registered. So your current job is gonna break like, and it's gonna be expensive for us like getting more memory for the server and like try to process those 50 users. So it's better to split it in two current jobs from my perspective. So again, we have this configuration form. Uh, it has all the credentials that uses the first cron job. And it also has a date. So this is important because they were processing da data before the event started. So let's say that they like process like 2000 users. And then we needed to decide after when we want to start like using these cron jobs to fetch new users. Because you don't want to start from the beginning since like you already process a lot of data. And probably you fix a lot of passwords and you don't want to mess with users from before. So you, you needed to start from the day. So it probably should be like date and time, but yeah. How do you, how, how do you handle data validation when you pull it from, put, put it into the queue API and then how do you get notified that there's any issues with validation? Because uh, that's a cron job, right? Yeah, so that's why we use ultimate, ultimate cron which is in the next slide. Okay. So this is an, an awesome country module. You should, you should use it. So because they allow you to, 
to schedule, like how often you want this cron task to run. So if you wanted, so for instance, we need it like every five minutes. And I have the two processes, the link one that is retrieving like all the JSON and mapping it to the QAPI and the heavy one. And this is a screenshot like here is like, it's saying like, okay, um, I run, there is no, no new users, so I didn't do anything. I run, no users. But this is, uh, it's really small, but it says updated. So it says if a user was created or a user was updated. So, so that's the visual representation that you needed. So you, you're like, yeah. And if there is an error, it's gonna show you an error. So that's how I usually catch errors on the current jobs. This is just a brief example. This is like the core of the of the first current job. Uh, I'm saving like that state of the day and the, if the if the current job were initialized in the state uh, management from Drupal. So I check if the event was initialized. Then I throw an error and say the user hey, this wasn't initialized. And then I, I create a service that is basically like like authenticating. So gets the token and iterates the attendees. And then if there are any attendees, I use uh, a variable. And then this is how you use the service, the queue service. So and this is how you like start creating items. Like each of those attendees is going to be created as a item in the, in the batch API. No, the queue API. Sorry. <laughs> and this is the the other thing that I did. I did a plugin. So Ultimate Cron is able to recognize these queue worker plugins. So you just need to add this uh, content in here. That is the ID of your event, and it's gonna show up in the ultimate prompt. So, and this is how I process each user. Any questions so far? And yeah, so this this if statement says like, hey, this user with this email exists in the database. If it doesn't exist, uh, create one user, and you pass the data of that user. And obviously this function like is a whole class that is like doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, so any questions so far? No? Okay, the next one, this is like my baby. <laughs> User merger, because it was a difficult task. Uh, it has a custom Vue.js interface, so I'm a big fan of Vue.js, I'm super biased. Um, um, it has a custom SQL query because um, this, this challenge was hard. Uh, so the problem was that sometimes like users register like with different emails, like twice. So the only way that they, so they, it was super hard to find like duplicates. So I needed to go to this Google sheet again and see like, oh, okay, the combination of this first name and this, and this last name uh, repeats over here. So this was a manual process and it was, it was, uh, it was time consuming, right? Oh yeah. yeah. So because we, we preload the database with all of these users and we can't quite get all the duplicates out of that. That's part of like the process, the, the parsing mechanism that we put into place. But what we needed was a user interface to say, well, you might be a duplicate, let an administrator come in and have a, a way to combine those users into one. Because we didn't want to lose the integrity of that person if you log in and you were an author and had presentations, and then suddenly you see no presentations, you're very confused. And so we had to w bring a, a way to bring different users together. Yeah, so basically we talk about the need, uh, locate the same, the users that have the same first name, last name. Um, and also like sometimes these users have like related content and roles already. So you need to add uh, another role and move all the content to this new user. So, and also another need was to be able to mark duplicates. Like for example, if there was another Israel Morales and he was like from another company. So that's another duplicate. So you don't want to see that appearing again. So I created a custom PD block or the couple block. 
and I create a SQL query. So I Google and I found something interesting in Stack Overflow. So basically, you run this query where you fetch all the users, and then um, for each user you run a subquery. So basically, you count if there are like multiple, more than one users with the same combination of username, uh, first name, and last name. So that way, you're you're able to tell if this this name is duplicated, you put it together. So it's it's pretty efficient because in the first iteration, I tried to do it with views. But it was like super slow, like trying to like create two different queries and try to match the coincidences. So it was just not not working well. So you can use sub uh, queries to do this. And the way I did it, I created a view and then I altered the view. So that was the easiest way to do it with Drupal. And that allows us to have this interface, which is like is is bare, is basic. But let's wait for the animation. So it's Vue.js, it's a block, but it's, it's like, an app, like a front-end application itself. So as you can see, I'm dragging one Israel Morales and I'm dragging the another one. So I miss merge from, merge to, you click the button, like everything happens uh, synchronously. So I had to create uh, some custom rows for that. And the roles, and the roles and the content are assigned to the new one. And also the, the old email is attached to a new field that is alternate email, so you don't lose data. So maybe you want to, if you, if you recognize that these users are the same, you want to keep this, the email, because you don't want to lose any data or the relationships to the content. So yeah, so and I use a, a library that detects like drop areas, so that was pretty cool. And I have, yeah, so I created some custom routes um, I'm using JSON because I want the the interaction between Drupal and and this front end application to be via JSON. So I don't want to return a view or something else. I don't want it to be lean and also like have permissions. Uh, this one is a post request, so you just pass like the ID of the user you want to merge from and the and the, ID, the user you want to merge to. And that way, like the logic doesn't happen in the front end; it happens in the back end, because it might be risky to have like that merge of the user in the front end. So I now that I just passed two user IDs, like I'm in PHP land, and I'm able to like process everything safely. And this is like the heart of the merge users, where you receive like the the user you're merging from and the other user. And you just return true or false. Like this was like it did merge or not. So I should wrap this in a try and catch exception. Yeah, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, full stack. I can yeah, so basically, yeah, so I have like private um, um, methods to like do each of like update presentations, update media. Um, all this kind of stuff, so it's separated. So it's not like a long like piece of code and everything is done in a single function. So and it's easier to debug. Like if something fails, like you just fix a piece of your code. Then you delete the user, you merge the user, and you return true or false. And um, yeah, that's, that's thank, all you, Israel. thank you, Thank <laughs> you. So in the application, we wanted to have a way for networking. Like everybody has to meet up. They need to be able to, to have voice chat or just be able to type um, and have conversations. So we created this uh, feature called Engage. And it actually, we kind of, we use it for networking, like affiliate booths and different breakout sessions. Uh, I don't mention anywhere else, but the, all of the presentations for the most part were still handled in Zoom. Um, but we had in it, like in it, links to those presentations throughout um, all of the applications so that you could easily access the Zoom session. But this, so this was much more for uh, actual networking effect. And so what we wanted to do with this is, is use uh, some open source tools, Jitsi and Rocket Chat. Uh, Rocket Chat has, you know, it's a Slack-like open source interface. And uh, so that would give us these, these large 
chat area groups and we could assign those to different places in the application. A Jitsi would of course give us our video chat component. And um, one of our engage, the actual interface looks something like this. So we combine, we combine the two, and this is a good example of kind of all, all kinds of different things. But Jitsi is here on the left. We have our integrated rocket chat on the right. So we actually take Jitsi, uh, the chat out of Jitsi, and just push it over to rocket chat. And I'll show why we do that. And then this is, this is just a node type. Um, and to invite attendees, you could actually use web form so it's able to send out uh, messages to people. And then the check-in feature was actually uh, using flagging. Uh, so of course, Jitsi is a Jitsi Meet, more specifically, is a conference, uh, confer video conferencing application. Uh, so you have a, a few options here. You can kind of host it yourself. Let's see if I touch on that. Yeah. Um, or you can use Jitsi as a service. The way we implemented it, uh, we hosted it ourselves, and then uh, we used the iframe API, and uh, we have a field that could read from uh, Drupal to then embed Jitsi specifically. Uh, so I was just speaking to that. There's, there's one-click deployments, so anybody can run their own Jitsi application. You can also jump in and, and just use their service uh, kind of nonstop, but there is a paid service out there too that they call Jitsi as a service. Uh, so if you are interested in this, it's, it's very, uh, very accessible. And it's improved a lot over the last couple of years because it's gotten more attention. It's a bigger need in different communities. So what we did here is uh, we'll actually use the, the Jitsi libraries from our actual service, uh, load that into, into Drupal, and then we just use Drupal behaviors to go ahead and attach information uh, directly from the engage. There's a little pre-processing done that I didn't attach here. Uh, but in the Jitsi uh, iframe API, you're, you're able to configure all of your options for your interface uh, directly, directly in an object. And then we essentially just create that room, uh, uh, attach it to a ID that's already in, um, in Drupal and being presented there uh, with all of those options. And I guess there's an important thing. So it, like the user info, we want to say, we want to take something out of Conflux and put it into Jitsi. So that's how we executed that. We, did, we take their email and their display name. Uh, so when you logged into Engage, you'd actually see your name in the application, even though it was integrated and coming from a different source and technically fully decoupled in that sense. Uh, Rocket Chat uh, was much, much more complicated. and. Uh, so this, of course, is embedded chat, and we wanted to use their omni-channel feature for, for support, which we're yet to fully implement, but that's kind of like your little chat box in the bottom right, I need help, and then like somebody can uh, speak to you right away. So that's their omni-channel omni -channel feature that they have. And uh, so we built custom module to kind of implement this in with uh, Drupal's field system, and uh, the deployment strategy I kind of mentioned earlier, this is the Node app that is coupled with Drupal. So we are actually have two applications running in, in platform. There was some heavy work we had to do to kind of figure that out and, and make that work. Um, so yeah, we've used, uh, we wrote a custom module. We used the HTTP client manager, created a service. Uh, I'm gonna probably read something verbatim here. Uh, I was not the one that developed this. He could not join us today. Um, but yeah, we, so we'd expose this Drupal service and we'd, we'd guzzle in the information uh, you know, from Rocket Chat and uh, allow the two applications to talk to one, an to talk to one another uh, because they were hosted in the same environment. We wanted to make sure uh, that they were only accessible to each other. Yeah, the next one. Yeah. Uh, so then we also used Rocket Chat's iframe integration that they have. So upon deployment, we put a few configuration settings into uh, Rocket Chat, and then we authenticate on the back end um, with that so we can set up an administrative user, et cetera, uh, so that, that when this displays, when you're logged in as a user, you get your information sent over to Rocket Chat and uh, 
and then we're able to embed that and you get an authentication token directly to speak to Rocket Chat that way. Um, and again, the, the platform SH component of it, you know, we chose, we, we were kind of already working on platform, but again, it allowed us to, to deploy this. And uh, we had to do some, some special things, I know, here because uh, we couldn't use their specific MongoDB um, instance, so we actually install this uh, directly via script whenever we deploy. So we're actually installing MongoDB and Rocket Chat, just one right after another. Um, and there's some custom code in, in the application to do so. And uh, every, every one of these deployments, we wanted to use as much uh, environment variables as we could. Uh, when the application's deployed, we wanted it to be set up our specific way. Yeah? Just for clarification, are you deploying everything within the platform, or is this wrapping in like Windows or DigitalOcean? No, they, they're both, both services are in, yep, there's a, the Drupal application's running in one app, and uh, Rocket Chat's running in another okay. on the same deployment. Okay, so yeah. Platform yeah, yeah, and then they can connect to each other because they're on the same network essentially. Yeah. So not so much about Rocket Chat, but you mentioned that platform SH is hosting each one of these sites as a separate site, a completely separate site. Mm -hmm. They all roll up underneath some subdomain, or every conference gets their own URL. Yeah. So the the deployment strategy that. That we implemented, of course, some of we would have liked to run everything off of a off of a subdomain. Um, we didn't end up doing that, so we do we have a full deployment with their own domain each and every time. So with the with the application, we just give them a domain of their choice. Usually, it's just something virtual.org, and and that's how we executed it. Yeah. And he, and of course, each one of those applications within Platform SH would have its own Git repository. Um, so we could choose if, if we made some implementations to our core application, uh, because these would get launched. The, the, when we had first started this, this whole project, it was very rapid and lots was changing very quickly. So to continuously deploy features to different sites and such, uh, their application would have to be up earlier than we were ready for it. Uh, so we wanted, that's what we did with the config ignore and this deployment strategy, we wanted to make sure that we could still push like our core work into these applications um, as, as quick as possible. So that was a, that was a challenge. Uh, again, so that is, that is the Conflux application. And I want to load up a couple examples uh, just for you guys to see. So this is a live example. Let me refresh and see how this works. Um, so immediately <clears throat> I'm logged in. It's our Jitsi server. My, Name is Conflux Admin, so that's in there. This is the this is the custom theme in the application. We're using uh, uh, Claro. Stephen, remind me the extra bits of Claro. Uh, gin. Gin. So, yeah, Claro plus Gin. Um, so that helps with the admin panel and the whole administrative side of things. Uh, we wanted this to be very app uh, feeling, etc. So you know your typical Drupal sites, it's just content um, usually. So this is kind of a way we actually developed an app in Drupal. Uh, you know, some time zone features and, and different search mechanisms to find presentations. Uh, of course, our menu system. Um, what's interesting about Rocket Chat, I'd like to point out, uh, the, way we, the reason we chose the field system was that on the back end of this, of this engage, I actually just have the channels, the two channel fields, so whatever I name these, if I went and put Rocket Chat in a different place in the system, I could call it the same thing, and it's actually going to pull in the same channel. So if I needed an affiliate to have an engagement, the affiliate on their page could have Rocket Chat displayed, or any other content type for that matter. Uh, and then I could also have it here, and it would be the same chat log, because on the back end, it's just a channel in, in Rocket Chat, and that's how it works. And the, again, the idea behind engagements is like birds of a feather or networking or breakout sessions, that kind of thing. And we promote people to come to these with, the, with check-in credits and, and different things like that to try to, to do gamification. So um, a little inside commentary. It, uh, I think you know, we've all experienced virtual conferences now. They're not, they're not that fun. The, the networking component is, is a challenge. Uh, we, we actually ended up partnering with Gather.town, which the, this camp used last year, 
Um, and so we've found a nice way to embed that into Conflux as well, but it's just an iframed application. They don't have a, a good API to work with. So uh, we did all kinds of interesting, interesting things to make that work. Uh, just a few statistics to kind of wrap up. I mean, we've, we've executed uh, or we've taken in over 25,000 submissions, so each one of those is a, is a presentation recorder. Um, and we've, we've hosted about 96 of these and had over 66,000 attendees. Again, back to why we chose Platform SH, it was we could deploy and very rapidly change our plan if we needed to based on the number of attendees um, because we would run as many as, we'd have as many as 5,000 users, but, but 2,000 might be active at a given time, and, um, and so that's where that kind of attendee number comes from, and thousands of Zoom calls, of course, et cetera. And of course, Conference Catalyst is hiring, so if this stuff is cool or interesting to you, I mean, we're trying to do uh, interesting projects. Uh, we're not really an agency. We do, we do product development and then support all these uh, associations and this application specifically to run events like this uh, in the virtual sense. We're really working on doing hybrid uh, is kind of the next step. How do we integrate what happens on site and what happens virtually at the same time? Um, so those are kind of the things we're working on. So I appreciate everyone coming.